happy yet. Okay, so we're out of Averitt. Yep, I left Averitt. Hit the road, hey, Averitt. Now, you said that you you didn't want to go to Averitt because you wanted to go into the airlines. When did you first get that idea that you wanted to do the airlines? When I was in high school, I, had, I heard, first thought about being a tour director, what have you, on a, on a cruise ship through Herbie Boardman. Herbie Boardman had been one of grandfather's star students. His mother was a teacher. His parents were friends of my parents. And Herb went on to work for um, Northern Shipping Lines. He became a Merchant Marine. He graduated from Merchant Marine Academy. And uh, he used to go all through South America. And he'd come back. Every time he'd come back, he always said, come to visit with my dad and he'd always bring a present, some jewelry for me or my mother. And he'd always talk about his dentures, his, you know, in South America and going and traveling and whatever. And that just sounded really neat. That's what I'd like to do. But again, they wanted you to have some travel experience. Well, how do you get travel experience? One of those things. And they really wanted, I think you had to be like 22 or 24 to get that job. So then the airlines would come along and they'd say, well, if you're 21, you know, you were t they'd take you. Oh, so you had to be 21. I had to be 21, yeah. So I wasn't 21 at the time I graduated from Avery, so I can't be doing something else. So I headed back to Birdsboro with grandmother and grandfather and went to Reading and got a job at Pomeroy's and I ended up becoming the sales training director. I was right out of college and went into this job. Just so happened the gal who was the sales training director, Mary Ann Chilius, was leaving because she was going to put more time into her radio show and she wanted to have a family. She was trying to get pregnant with her kids. And uh, when I went in to interview for this job and then they had me go talk to Mary Ann. Now, grandfather knew Luke Chilius, her husband, because he was with the engineering company that was putting the sewer system all through Birdsboro. So I'd heard that name forever and ever. And there's another, some other way I moved Mary Ann. I can't, I can't, that doesn't come back here now. But anyhow, so they had me go and talk to her too. And when I talked to her, I said, you know, I said, this sounds like a fun job. And I was like, I like it. And I said, but I don't know that I have enough experience for this. She says, oh, she says, you'll be fine. She says, if you can think on your feet and you can talk, you're going to be fine and you're, you're perfect for this job. I don't know, okay, so I got the job. I was making $50 a week and I got a 20% discount. Well, and this place was known for their clothes and when I was up, this was the place for anything. I had my own office. And I was training all the new people who came in how to use the cash register and how to train. I wrote the store newspaper. I didn't like that part at all. <laughs> I couldn't spell, and half the time I had to give it to my boss, Mr. Heimbach, who was a big old Pennsylvania Dutchman. And he would, you know, how if, if you, you went to college at night, I said, I'm telling you, I told you this before a game, I can't spell. Well, that's why they made a dictionary. That's right. You know, he was a nice man, and he liked me. And the other one that worked there was Ruth Bedard. Ruth was a friend. I bless her. She got the, she had a daughter, Diane, had all kinds of health problems, heart health problems. She made $35 a week. She basically ran the store, lived in Fleetwood in the apartment above that bank. And we went there once or twice for dinner with, with you kids then. She's been a friend of mine forever. Uh, Ruth took, put me under her wing and she directed me. So just for some context, so you're making $50 a week, mm -hmm. that's $10 a day. Mm -hmm. What were the prices of other things? I mean, what could you buy with 10 bucks or, I mean, oh, what would, 
You didn't have it. Did you own a car? No, I didn't have a car. A bar. Grand, at that point, grandmother, grandfather had a car. Or I took the bus from Birdsboro up to, and it dropped me off right in front of Pomeroy, so that was no big deal. Uh -huh. um, I have to think what the price of things were. I, I guess I relate mostly to clothes because I right. built myself a clothes wardrobe, but I would buy, the same part is, I'd say to grandmother because she loved the hats, you know, let's go halvesies on this hat. And the hat might be $10. That was pretty much funny for a hat. Well, a day's work. Yeah, so, you know, I put five in, she put five, and then we took turns wearing it, you know. Ended up getting it. Uh, dresses, but I was always put so much money aside, save. I never went and spent, no, I always put 10 bucks in or whatever it was a week and saved my money. Do you remember what tuition was at Avery, Preston? Yes, it was $900 for the year, tuition and board. $900 for the year? Mm -hmm. That's why Pam went there. It was the cheapest school that her father could find to send her to. So if you made $50 a week, you made $5,200. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, fifty dollars a week. You made twenty six hundred dollars a, mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. The tuition was nine hundred dollars. So okay, yeah. I was moving along there. I was hitting a big time. Yeah. But then I was only there maybe two months or so, and then I got a five dollar raise. And just then, for being you. And yes, <laughs> for mumbling me. And then they had another another thing, another two, and I got another five dollar raise. And I felt terrible about this because here was Ruth, who ran the damn place, had a daughter who had health problems. She was a single woman. And she was making $35 a week. And she was there before you got there? Oh, yeah. She'd been there a good five years before. I mean, she so was, what, was the, what was the discrepancy? What was going on? Well, part of the deal... Did you a college degree? Or? Well, part of it is, yes, I had a degree. The other part was... Mr. Heller, who was the manager of the store, who was a brain and a real character, he really liked me, and he was grooming me to move up with Allied in New York City. Who was Allied? Allied was one of the main, there were three major buying corporations for most department stores in the United States, and Allied was considered the top one. And he was getting groomed to move in there as a top wig. Uh -huh. And he was going to have me go along there. So every time the big wigs from Allied came, he'd have me going around with him with the review of the store and sit in on all the talks. And then, what are your opinions, Sally? And what do you see? And he wanted them to see me as he saw me. You know? And... After those things, I would be getting another thing. It did dawn on me at the time. I mean, it was just like, how does this happen? I'm only here and I'm doing this. And all the time, I was still, I had been in contact with the airlines. I had to wait till I was 21. And they wanted me, I, I had contact TWA, Eastern, United, and American. TWA and United accepted me right off the bat, except they both wanted me to lose 10 pounds. What did you weigh? Oh God, I don't know what I weigh. 132, 130 and how something. how tall were you? Five foot three, three quarters. Did you think you were overweight? I didn't, but they did. That was their regulation. So, and the other two, they, were, they put you like on a, waiting list, qualifying list type of thing. You either got a rejection or you were on the waiting list. So I was on the waiting thing for the other two. So, okay, I had started in September. At the, I thought, okay, I've got X number of months here. Goodbye. I don't want to diet. <laughs> and myself gone. In the meantime, I was getting raises. And, you know, this was a good gig I had going on here. You know, it worked out fine. Uh, it was fun. I enjoyed it. And I'm glad I did it. I learned a lot more than I realized at the job. You know, I was young, ditzy, 
close horse. So you were going to turn 21 in what year? April. In 58. Yeah. April 58. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. So. So you spent a, almost a year at Pummel Horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I had gone to the, and I got accepted. But when I got accepted to TWA, they used to have me come down to Philadelphia once a month to get weighed in and check. I had to get lose that weight, maintain that weight for six months. I wanted to be down 120 pounds and keep it there. So I did that, unbeknownst to any of the people I'm working with. Later. So I reached the goal, fine and dandy. We accept you, you've been accepted. You'll come into the class starting February 22nd, I think I used to go to Kansas City. So, six weeks, once I got that letter, I, six weeks before in, I go in to Dr. Mr. Heimbach and Mr. Heller and say, I went to Mr. Heimbach first because he was the employment manager and I said, I have something to tell you. I said, I've been accepting airlines and I'm supposed to report in six weeks and you know, I'd like to hand in my resignation. Oh, Sally, you can't do that. You can, you're going to have to go tell Mr. Heller. You're going to have to go tell him. I said, well, why? But we're just going to, you know, he just, he has plans for you, and, and, and you're going to have time. And he was, he was a nice guy, but he was kind of a gruff guy, a little short guy. He had heavy glasses. He used to walk around with his hands behind his back, and he had this big desk, and the, the desk was 20 times bigger than him, and his chair was bigger than he was, and he had a very strong voice. I said, okay, I'll go tell Mr. Heller. I, 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 so I go in, I'm Mr. Heller, it's like a zinc hole. And he's sitting at his desk like this, and he's kind of sitting back, he's like, and leaning way back. He goes, so now what's up with you, he says. It's like, uh, I, he didn't say sit down. And so, so I just stood there and I said, well, I have something to tell you. About that, I said, I've been accepted by TWA, and I said, they want me to start, and can we say, I said, that's so I'm giving you my resignation. Well, he sat there, his hands on the glasses, rocked back and forth in the chair, which seemed like for an hour, never said a word. And finally he stops rocking, he sits back and he says, I hope you get pregnant on your night of your honeymoon. <laughs> never in my life. But he was that Was that a compliment? Or a yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he, was, he, he was one of those kind of jokester, too, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know. yeah. And that's why a lot of people didn't know how to take him, and yet I would bat off of him all the time, and I think that was one reason why he did like me, even though he saw such great potential in me. So, anyway, I just cracked up. I just cracked up. I said, well, I guess that's fair. <laughs> he said, What's fair is fair. What are you doing this? He said, I had you all set. He said, they were ready to give you this job in New York. Oh, I was ready to take you. They wanted you. They thought, you know, I had showed them what you've been, all you had to offer, you know. And I said, Mr. Howard, I really appreciate that. And I said, I'm very flattered. I said, but I'm 21 years old. I may not have this opportunity forever to be able to fly because at that point, when you turned like 32, you had to quit flying. I said, uh, and I said, you know, you can't be married and fly and so forth. I said, I can always come back into retail. If I really have all this talent, ability, and foresight that you say I have, I'll always be able to do that. But I won't always have this opportunity. And I said, in that day and age, that was a big deal. That was a big opportunity. Not big people who flew, let alone worked for a company to fly and went and lived in a different city. And, I mean, this was... This is a trailblazer stuff. And uh, I said, I feel I've got to do it. If I don't do it now, I'll never have this chance again. And he said, well, I have to agree with you. And he said, you are right. And he said, I wish you luck. And he said, I, I, I'm i glad you came and, and told me and so forth. Come so back when, after you get pregnant. Yeah. So when I left at that time, after you completed your training, they would always put your, send your picture back to your local newspaper, you know, so-and-so completed their training, TWA will be based in so-and-so. So he wrote me a note. Congratulations, brother, your picture doesn't do you justice. 
Please have another picture taken immediately, if not sooner. But continued good sense and good luck. About six months after that, he got made a vice president of Allied. See, he knew it was Kaplan. And they had a picture of him in the paper. Grandmother had sent it to me. So I wrote him a note back. Congratulations. Uh, as per pictures, yours is not doing you much justice either. <laughs> Please get another picture taken because yours will be ha hanging up on the walls of New York and it must look much better than this. Sincerely, <laughs> and then, with much affection and appreciation. Whatever. Never heard from him again, never saw him again, or whatever, but uh, he was a nice man. So I often wondered what, what my life would have been or what, but he was looking out for me. Uh, that was a crazy experience. So I went in the airlines. Never regretted that either. So that was... Uh... <clears throat> April 1958, or somewhere in there. Yeah. Spring 1958. Eight, eight, seven. Try it out all that. Went there in a snowstorm. Supposed to go. Snow came. It was like 49 inches of snow. The lights went out. I packed my suitcase with flashlight and and candles. Crying, I'll never get there, I'll never get there, I won't be you able to get, get to Philadelphia. Philadelphia. I had to get to Philadelphia to fly out to Kansas City. Grandfather says, I'll get you there if I have to carry you on my back. The night before I was to go, it's no more. I thought, I'll never get He got me there. This snow, there's pictures of me, then I left the snow banks were up to here, and I had this beautiful spring hat on, and oh. Got on that plane and off I went from Philadelphia to Chicago, Chicago to Kansas City. Got in Kansas City like 11 or 12 o'clock at night. It was freezing cold. But that was so a, you were based in Kansas City? Based in Kansas City. Went there to be trained. And then after you done with your train, they would decide where you would get sent. And I was in the largest class they had ever trained. There were like 98, 95 in my class. Most of them were English and, and uh, Irish because they were so short of flight attendants. They were going to Europe and recruiting them and bringing them over. Why were they short? They were just short. That, it was the it was that everyone wanted to be in. Well, everybody wanted to be in, but the flight industry had been growing, grew so fast, and there was a little sense of affluence, and people thought, oh, we'll try flying, and we will travel and fly, and so it became, it was a big thing, and, and they didn't, they were building planes faster than they could, and they, they needed the crew, and at that point, they wanted their international crews to speak two, two languages, yeah. and so finding that in the United States was not easy, so they went to England and Ireland and picked these gals up. So there were 98 in our class, and they, this was the first time one guy got smart. One guy was a, he was a pilot, and he bought an old uh, uh, hotel, motel, and he restored it and rented it to TWA to be our dorms, which turned out pretty good, good gig. We were the first, first class to go into it. So there were four of us that would live in a we had two, you know, two bed bedrooms, and there was a little kitchenette thing, and, and that was fine. And they would feed us our meals. I think one night a week, or every night of the week, there was a central place where they had a big dining room for us to eat. Um, so I did that for six six weeks. It's where I met I met Big Margaret and got to know her. She wasn't in my particular class or my unit. We were divided into four basic units. But you got to know everybody in all the different units. And then you got to bid for where you wanted to be based. Well, everything in the airline is based on age. And I was one of the youngest in the group. Most of these gals were 22, 23, 24 years old, especially the girls from Europe. Oh. So they got first dibs of where they wanted to go. My well, 
they wanted to go to San Francisco, they wanted to go to New York, you know, they wanted to get out of these little birds they were in, and this is big time. And TWA had bases in Newark at that time, they had bases in Pittsburgh, they had bases in Detroit, and I didn't want to go to Pittsburgh nor Detroit. So I'm trying to figure out, and I'm watching all these numbers that would be on the board every night, and people were switching here and going there, and there was a special date when you finally had to have everything set, you know. You could switch a lot, but, and I'd be listening to everybody, and I thought, best place for me, if I'm going to have any chance of really doing something different and not have it, why don't I stay right here in Kansas City? This is where it's all happening. This is the hub of everybody, and I can go east or west from here. And there aren't a lot of senior people here, and these dodos, that new ones that were coming in, the seniors in your class, you, you, your age was by your class, but then once you got thrown into your base, then your age got shuffled again, you know. So I thought, I'll stay here in Kansas City if I can. That was it. So I, I Kansas City... And I think I had Boston as my second chance. And I got Kansas City. And I think I was one of maybe six out of our class that stayed in Kansas City. And the ones that stayed in Kansas City were people who were from Kansas City and wanted to be there. And Big Margaret was one of them. And then when we started to fly, because of our seniority, that's how she and I got together because we were the low ladies on the totem pole and that's how we became friends. But I didn't live with her the first six, eight months, maybe a year, I lived with these six other gals who were looking for a runway. The thing was on a bulletin board. I called them up. I met up with them. Again, I was the youngest in the group. They were all older. They had all been flying. But that was a good deal for me, too, because they showed me the ropes, took me under their wings, and I learned uh, what to do. And we lived in this gorgeous house out on the parkway, right near where the halls of Hallmark fame lived. And this crazy woman rented this house to six flight attendants, which was completely furnished. It had a bar in the basement. It had a beautiful patio everything and uh, it was fun but the thing was if you didn't have a car a taxi drive was five dollars one way that was a lot of money back in 1950 something because the old airport was right downtown and uh, so we developed a group of hoster hop hostess hopper friends guys who wanted to date flight attendants and they'd hang out at the airport like ants <laughs> And you'd see, oh, hey, you need a ride. Oh, no, no. Some of them you didn't want to be seen dead with, but some of them were all right. Yeah, sure. Very nice thing. I have, get, I have to get out to get out to the plaza, past the plaza. Oh, oh. Oh, okay, okay. Of course, it would be worth, at that time, every person on the plane was allowed two free drinks. If they didn't drink, they, as you checked your, your flight kit in, if they didn't drink the bottle, okay, but if the bottle was open and empty, well, then that was considered the customer had drank what was in it. Well, we used to have another box with supplies in it, and some supplies for two glass baby bottles. So, Joe Blow, who was the hostess hopper, of the week was going to give you rides home. What kind of booze do you need, Joe? Well, I need bourbon. All right, so the baby bottle would be there, and anybody that wasn't drinking, they weren't drinking bourbon. Bourbon went in the bottle, we put the empties in there. Oh, yeah, well, your passengers drank. Yeah, oh, they all like bourbon this trip. It seems that way. You know? Oh, who went? He, Joe got his bottle of bourbon, and that was it. I always say my favorite story is the time when Jim Johnson, who was a guy I dated and was a good friend of Big Margaret and her husband, he was a, a writer for uh, Kansas City Star and then went on for the uh, Catholic Post, I think. Um, anyway, he had a party and we kept him well supplied because he was our main, main driver. 
and somebody was at his house and went down the basement and something said, Jim, why do you have 200 and some baby, empty baby bottles? <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's why we have all this wonderful liquor here. <laughs> what did you get paid by TWA? You know, that's a good question. And I don't really remember anymore. Hmm. Was it more than what Pomeroy's was paying? It was more than what Pomeroy's got us. But we had to we had to buy our own uniforms. So that was taken out of your out of your pay. You could either pay for your uniforms yourself, you know, like upright, or they would take so much out. And I remember that was my going away present from grandmother and grandfather. They said they would pay for my first set of uniforms. How many we, uniforms did you have? Well, we had winter and we had summer. So you'd have uh, a jacket. You had two jackets and two skirts. And then you had your blouse slip. So that was two there. You had your hat, your winter coat. You had to buy your own shoes. Your suitcase, your purse. Then you had a summer uniform, which was green, lightweight, and that, that you didn't have a coat with. It was just the jack at the top, one of you. So I remember they bought me my uniform, so I wouldn't have to have that come out of, out of my pay. And I know we paid the one place. We moved into the house. We lived in the, I first lived in the apartment with the six. And we paid forty dollars a week for each of us for our apartment. When we moved in the house, we paid fifty dollars a week. But what else we paid in there? I I don't remember if we paid more for if we had to pay for electricity and that part. I don't remember. As far as food went, well, when we were all there, but we were never all there at the time, or very seldom. And when we were, well, then that was a big deal. And then we'd put money in a pot and say, hey, you know, we really need to go get mayonnaise and this and that. We always seemed to have milk, and there was always coffee because we were bringing that off the plane. And we had bread and butter, which we brought off the plane, and the toilet paper we brought off the plane, and the Kleenex. And we had little silverware <laughs> and little glasses. It's recent bankrupt. That's why airlines went bankrupt. Their, their employees were cleaning them up. Our joke was we were building a plane in the basement of, of the house, you know. We had blankets and pillows, and, and one day I, one gal came back, Ellie, and she threw a Bible on the thing. And I said, Ellie, I don't think that's very kosher. Well, we don't have one, she said. They had Bibles on the plane? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I guess that makes Gideon sense. Gideon Bible, you betcha. You betcha. Lots of magazines. You know, we had everything with first aid kits. So, to where did you fly? I flew just about any place TWA went, east and west, within the United States. You know, I got to fly to San Francisco and L.A. and San Diego and Albuquerque. And, and uh, Margaret and I flew the fl first flight that they had from Kansas City to Miami. We were thrilled. We couldn't wait that, oh, we got that flight. Well... That turned about to be the flight from hell because you had all these Jewish ladies who were on there with all their meat coats and all that. Miss, 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 miss. And Margaret says, if I hear one more tell me and miss, they're going to get this coat down their throat, you know. So we thought, oh, we were going to be so lucky to get to Miami. It's going to be warm because they did it in the winter, naturally. We swim in the swimming pool. It's going to be so great. Well, by the time we got there, we were so exhausted waiting all these women. And uh, well, that, that was one of our first flights. But then we, you know, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and they had a lot of long flights. I mean, they had a lot of flights that went from Kansas City to St. Louis, St. Louis to uh, Cleveland, Cleveland to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh to Philadelphia. Then you'd lay over in Philadelphia for 24 hours, and then you'd turn around and would do... Pittsburgh, Wheeling, Wheeling, Cleveland, Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City. You know, with a lot of dependent, you bid your flights 
for the days you wanted off. Well, how many days did you work a, a it month? It depends, depending how many hours. You could only, you I could, think, work, I, I want to see, you could work 50 hours a month, let's say. So you had to figure out that's actual air time. It wasn't counting the time you were in, checking in and making sure everything was on the plane and all that happy crap. You had to be at the airport at least two hours before your flight, get there and check it in and blah, blah. So the name of the game, the, your life in the airline, was what kind of days did you want to have off? And uh, most, most young people were trying to bid weekends and weekends off or be able to get where they wanted to be for a weekend. Uh, during the week, most of the time, it didn't really matter. You know, you could bid those flights any which way you wanted. But sometimes you had to fly all this screwy stuff during the week in order to be able to get that weekend off. But, uh, that's the art. And it's still the same way. I had a laugh on the flight that I had up here, Southwest. These two, a guy and a gal, they were going back and forth about how they were trying to get this particular weekend off and how they were trying to work it around with so-and-so and they couldn't get this hour off and, and whatnot. Had a laugh. Some things never change 50-some years later. What? Well, flying has changed. Oh, dear God, yes. More ways than one. Just the way the people themselves dress when they fly. Just one of the services that airlines provide. Some good, some bad. But it was a good experience and I'm glad I did it. Again, met a lot of interesting, fabulous people. Got you thrown into experiences where you had to think on your feet. Wasn't somebody taking your hand all the way along the way. Yeah. And, uh, did you ever feel it was dangerous? Or did you ever feel... No. One time we had uh, a deal when we went 500 feet and came down 500 feet and we were on our way from Pittsburgh, from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. It was Margaret and I, it was Sunday night, we were working a flight. She was handing out the food, I was working in the galley and it was rough, we knew it was rough and all of a sudden we went, whoop, and down and luckily for Margaret there was a guy, an Air Force guy, that was, she was on the aisle, he was on the aisle, and he realized what was happening. He grabbed her and pulled her down on his lap. She would have been still bouncing, you know. She could have still bounced. I went down and held on to the poles that were on the uh, heating racks for the food that came in on the trays, because they were anchored, and I held on to them. And then... We still had some bouncing and everybody was quiet and you know, then pilot came on and said what had happened and to, to do and there were potatoes and people's hair and peas all over the place and gravy and what have you. And so Morgan says, Well right now what do we do? I said, Well I think we get all the pillowcases and we'll have them put their tray and give them napkins and get them to wipe themselves off and put it all in there and try to get it cleaned up the best we can that way. So that's what we did. We kicked the pillows off the pillows. We made blue night on pillows, but they'd probably have some plastic bags on board. Got them all filled up and gave them all rags so they could wipe themselves off. And then we announced that when they got off, if they went to the desk, they would get a cleaning voucher get their clothes dry cleaned, et cetera, and so forth. And then we had one where they thought the, the wheels were going to come down when we were landing in Kansas City, and we went around for five hours using up all the gas and everything, and they followed us all in and foamed the runway, but that turned out to be nothing. 
had a guy that was drunk, very, very drunk on a New Year's fight from Kansas City to Wichita. It was snowing like hell. Why we ever took off, I don't know. I really felt the flight was going to cancel. It didn't. And this flight was a continuing flight from New York, and there was a young a man was on with a newborn baby, was probably about eight, ten days old. It was his daughter's baby, and he was bringing the baby back to Wichita for private adoption. They were going to get rid of the baby out of the family. I don't think this guy had ever been about a baby in his life. And everybody was trying to help keep the baby quiet and fed, not crying, whatever. And then we had these two guys who would admit too much to drink. And they're yelling, well, I can get this plane off the plane. Why aren't you flying? We can fly the plane. I don't know. So we waited and we waited and the weather kept getting worse and worse. I think we were like three hours on the ground until we finally decided this, they, this plane wasn't going to take off. And I said, well, that's fine and dandy, but we got a man on here with a baby who has a clue what to do with this baby and it's got to be fed and get warm and what on it. And these other two nitwits, they're ten shades of wind, they don't even know where they're at. So they had got the guys off the plane and arrested them, put them in jail to clear up. And the guy with the baby, they took the baby, Children's Services came and took the baby and put the baby in the hospital overnight, which was probably the best thing they would have been able to do. And I remember being in the, being in the taxi driving back past out to the plaza snowed like hell and uh, the bells are ringing it was new year's and the cab driver said oh happy new year miss and i said yeah happy new year to you and i thought i wonder many a new year whatever happened to that baby So what was uh, your relationship like with uh, Pop at this time? Oh good, he was in the Air Force. Of course, at that time we decided to get we got engaged in August of 58. So you November of 58. So you were in, you had been with TWA more okay. than a year by then? Mm-hmm. Okay. And, uh, he decided he was going in the airline, going in the Air Force. He got accepted in the cadet program. And they sent him off down to San Antonio. And, uh, he was down there and I was in Kansas City. And um, I was still going out with different guys. I mean, they all knew I was engaged, but I would Take me out for dinner. Or How did he propose? Oh, he gave me my ring in the front of the circle at uh, the Philadelphia airport. They used to have a big circle there, and I was worked one of these crazy flights where I came in like on Saturday night at eleven o'clock, but then I didn't leave till no, I came in Friday night at eleven o'clock and didn't have to leave until Monday evening, like at six o'clock. So that was a really long layover. And I, I like that. That got me home. Most people didn't want to do that because they didn't want to be stuck in Philadelphia where you couldn't drink after 12 o'clock, you know. And, was, you know. and he came to meet me, and I came out and got in the car, and we knew we were getting engaged. You know. And uh, I thought, now when's he going to give me this ring? When I mean, I so every time he would meet me, he'd always have a roll of... Uh, Experiment lifesavers. I don't know how that got started, but anyhow. Uh, so, give me, give me, so I thought, oh, the ring will be on the experiment lifesavers. Then he was doing something else, driving all around. Well, he ended up, he had the ring on his little finger, on this hand. And he's driving, driving, driving. And, and he kept going all like this. Can't remember. And all of a sudden, that was like, Wait a minute, what's, what, what's wrong with your finger? Then, that's all that so that's how it went. Uh, and he worked that whole summer in the, the slag pits, driving a slag truck with 
E.G. Brenneman Road Company made the money to buy the ring, and they bought the ring down in Philadelphia. Joe Freiberger, Baca's old buddy that had a jewelry row in Philadelphia, <coughs> bought the stone, and then they had the ring set. <clears throat> Did you pick out the stone? Mm-mm. Oh, okay. No, I told him what I would like. Oh, yeah. I never saw it. Either. Okay. When you got engaged in 58, mm -hmm. did you did you set the date for the wedding right away, or did you? We, pretty well, we... Well, we waiting, we figured he'd be done with cadet program, and by that time, he would know where he was going to get stationed, so we figured it would be in August. But then in the meantime, he got washed out of the cadet program because they pulled his teeth, and he didn't have enough teeth to fly. So then we had to go to plan B, and that's when he said, well, I can, I got to get a degree. I got to get some kind of drug. I go, well, I can do pharmacy. I know pharmacy, and I'll be able to get in the pharmacy school. So Johnny switched from pharmacy school and went to Albright. Your father got out of Albright, went to pharmacy school, and that was it. And we figured, well, we won't have a car. I probably could have kept flying. That's what I was doing. I thought, oh, I could keep flying. I could fly out of Newark because CWA had a base there. But that year they got rid of that base. So. I'd have to go into New York, fly to New York. Well, we didn't have a car to begin with. So trying to get up to New York and get a flight and get back and all this kind of stuff was kind of, so we crashed that idea. That wasn't going to work. So then when he found out that he was, could go to pharmacy school, well, he could take the train to pharmacy school. And we had the apartment underneath my grandmother's house that became empty. So we could live in that apartment. 50 bucks a month to walk to 9th and Penn, 9th and Franklin, get the train, go to pharmacy, so walk to pharmacy, get back on, come on. Okay, so you got married in August of 59. Correct. And at that time, you were still working for the airline. No, I left the airline once I got married. Uh, no, but I mean... So when was your last month with the airline? August. Oh, so it was, okay. So, but at, right before then, you were still working for TWA. Mm -hmm. And, and Pop was going to Albright? He just got out of the Air, Air Force, Force, but he went to Albright to take some classes because he knew there were some classes he was going to need for Temple. Got it, okay. So that summer he took some classes. Yeah. All right. So once you got married, then you moved in together with, on your own, or? Yeah, we were in the apartment on Chester apartment. Street, 908 okay. Chester Street. Okay. We lived upstairs. My grandmother lived downstairs. Right. And we had that. And then I got a job at the Jeanette shop, very fancy women's shop. Dress shop, right? Mm hmm Very nice. And I could walk there. I was down at Fifth and Penn. And your father walked And then he up started the school, he started going to Temple in the fall of 59. Mm -hmm. On the train. And on Four the train. days a week, five days a week? Five days a week. Go get the train at 5.30 and would get home at 6.30 or 7, depending on which train he got on. And then once he got to Philadelphia, he'd walk to the pharmacy school, which is like another eight, ten blocks away. So he did a lot of walking. Packed the lunch every day. The joke was it was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, a box of raisins, sometimes some cookies or an apple. A lot of sugar. <laughs> and then he would buy a bagel when he got there for a quarter and a pint of milk for a quarter. That's why he ate in the fields down there. We did not have a car the first three years we were married. We took the bus. If we wanted to get down to like Nanabacas, we'd take the bus. Or Nana would come in with the car and then we'd go down and then they'd let us have the car for the night or the weekend or something. But that didn't happen often 
because they needed the car for the deliveries at the pharmacy, you know. Well, if you took the bus from Chestnut Street to mm -hmm. Riften, did it drop you off there right at the top of the hill in Riften? Yeah, I mean, it dropped you over that little train, yeah. that little thing was across from where Allen lived. Yeah. Yeah. So then you walked a couple blocks up. Yeah. Or we'd get to Mount Penn, and then Nana would like be bringing Baca his dinner, and then we'd take Nana home, and then oh. we'd take the car that way, one way or the other. Or we'd get, on well, we'd get grandmother's and grandfather's car, one of their cars, and they'd bring it up, and we'd borrow that for the weekend. Uh, well, we had no money to begin with, so we weren't we going a lot. Our favorite joke was we one time we were too broke to even go to a free dance because we had the, it was a free dance at Temple, but the easiest and quickest way to get there, you had to go down the turnpike, and we didn't have the money to pay for the turnpike things, so and we didn't go to the free dance. Uh. So... Get married in August of 59, mm -hmm. he's going to school, and you get pregnant. Yes, I did. Right off the bat. What do you remember about that? That was rather a shock. <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't know why I just didn't think I would ever get pregnant that quick or whatever thing. I didn't think I was ever going to get pregnant, but anyway. I, but everybody was delighted and thrilled and blah, 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 blah. And then I said, well, okay, now you got to work. Well, I was working in this fancy dress shop. And I didn't really have the wardrobe to work in that dress shop. And Especially go, not paternity clothes. Uh, yeah, paternity clothes at that time weren't exactly wifty difty And it would, to go out and buy that, I would have probably spent more than they even had to be able to do it. So it was kind of concluded about all of us, it'd probably be best if I just stopped working. So I did. And mm. you were born, and my grandmother was downstairs. I know she was thrilled. And she used to come up every day, or I'd take you down, and, and she'd get you in your pajamas, and she'd give you your bottle before you went to bed. And she, she thoroughly enjoyed that. That was a hap one of the happier times with my grandmother. She was not exactly always a happy person. She was always waiting for someone else to entertain her and keep her happy. And, but she was happy that, that period of time. When did her husband die? Oh, I was only like 18 months, two years old. Mm. And then he had an embolism after a car accident. Mm. You know, they left him out of the hospital, said, always oh, fine, but I don't know, they killed him. Uh, well, everybody says he was, a, you know, he was a heck of a guy. He was, grandfather was him, personality of him. Bob was major like her like his mother, you know, quiet, uh, retrospective, whatever you were. Grandfather was very gregarious, outgoing. Everybody knew him. What did he do? Oh, he did a lot of things. He had uh, aerialists in the circus. He, w he worked as a ship worker, a ship builder. He worked in a radio shop. He was very interested in that kind of stuff. He, he had a radio shop for a while, did that. His last big job was he worked for AB, ABC uh, Beverage Company and went around to bars and restaurants and stuff and sold them, you know, the soft drinks and stuff. All right, so let's see. Quick dress shop. I am born in July. Mm -hmm. Then Mark is born in September. That was a really big choice. And then that was in between that. My grandmother died that July, July before Mark was born. Oh. She'd had a stroke. And she died. And so right now what's going to happen, we're going to sell the apartment, we're going to do this. So my father and Bob and Helen, my mother, they had the big powwow. And Thanks to Bob and Helen, they said that we could live, they agreed for us to live there free. And that Bob and Helen and my mother and father would take care of the utilities and the taxes and that. We paid for the telephone, remember that. And it would have been for them, I don't know where we would have gone or what, or they hadn't agreed to that position. 
part of it was they knew they would have had, there was a lot of work that had to get done in that apartment. That apartment hadn't had anything done to it in probably about 10 years, and so it was gonna need a lot of work. And so it was, they figured they'd let us stay there for another year and a half until Frank could get his degree and be out working, and then they'd sell it, rather than trying to fix it up and rent it up. Because they knew, and they're pretty sure the Gaumans were going to buy it, so they had a ready-made market. So that was why they went really went along with it. But it was nice they went along with it because it sure made things a lot easier and simpler. And so you weren't renting it; it was it was at that after after that point. No, after my grandmother died, or that they said then we wouldn't have to pay any rent. We would pay the oh I see. We paid the electric bill, oh, the electric bill or the phone bill. I don't remember what it was. We paid we paid one of the bills. I remember that. And they took care of the, the insurance and the taxes. And then when, it was really a year after, when, once your father graduated from college. He graduated in less than four years, right? Yes. Yes, because they accepted a lot of his stuff he had at Albright. And he had taken a couple extra credits and that stuff. So he started fall of 59, when did he graduate? Uh, After Marky was born. June, June of the year before Margaret was born, yeah. So, 62. Two. He, was, he graduated June of 62. Flag day. June 19th, I remember. Yeah. And then but he, he went for three years. He, went to, he graduated in three years. Yeah. And he had, uh, and then he got the job with Upjohn. How Up, soon did he get it? Right away. So right. he got it right after graduate, before Margaret was born. Yeah, yeah. We moved, we, he was working for Upjohn that summer before Margaret was born, and we moved to Church Street. I, Margaret was born and we had already bought the house in Church Street because he was painting the rooms and stuff. And we brought Margaret home from the hospital to Church Street. In Allentown. Yeah, and of course that was kind of a touchy deal too because Baca really thought Poppy was going to come work in the pharmacy with him, uh -huh. and Poppy didn't want to do that, and Grandfather just thought Poppy would have been the ideal up John salesman. That <laughs> wasn't the ideal either. But anyway, Poppy didn't want to get near Baca. I think that was the main thing, and we got a car. From Upjohn. And uh, we, I inherited, my grandmother left me $2,000 in a bond, and that was the money we used to buy the house in Church Street. That's how we got the house. The house was $19,500. What was his uh, salary from Upjohn, do you know? Oh, I want to say $400 a month and a car yeah. and health insurance yeah. and a paid vacation. So. Um, and what was his territory? Mm, he had sections of uh, Allentown uh, or around Allentown, like Northampton. He had both, well, he didn't have Allentown and Bethlehem itself. He had the areas all around, like Northampton and, and Bath and Hockendaqua and that whole kind of stuff. And then all around there, he went down to Quakertown. Was his job any different from, from grandfather's job? Was no. he the sales rep? In fact, he had a lot of the same territory as a grandfather, because grandfather, when he started, he had Oh, big area. And then they cut grandfather's area down. Her grandfather's area was more like the outside. The areas in between inner Philadelphia and inner Reading, he had everything else that was in that kind of a section. Was there a, a, a commission component to the pay too, or was it strictly salary? No, it was strictly, strictly salary. Mm. But they got bonuses every year. Based on salary. You know, volume. on, you know. That kind of thing, but it, you know, you're, you got a base salary and that was it, but you've got bonuses. So he wasn't really cut out for it? He liked it, but it wasn't adventurous enough. Your father was too inquisitive. He wanted to be his own boss. He didn't, 
And well, you kind of had autonomy, didn't you? I mean, oh, well, he did, but it still was enough. He had that good old boy. What was his name? Minnie Honey's uh, boss. That was grandfather's boss, and you know, and, and your father. Some rules and regulations with corporations and company to him were just ridiculous, dumb stuff. Just paperwork or shuffle work, and that used to drive him up the wall. He wanted to be his own boss, and uh, he did well. I mean, he got bonuses, nominations, and he did well at it, but not there, but he could find more ways to goof it around or spend more time to lead out. And he came on one day, and I saw this place, and I, and I want you to see it. Oh, it's this, and it was a model car racing center. And he's standing there, and he's telling me all about this. And I said, and you want to have one? Oh, no, 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 no. I just want you to go look at it. <laughs> and I just saw that gleam in the eye. And then, before that, before that, a year before that, he had gotten in that he wanted to go back to college. He wanted to get his medical degree. He was all into going, doing that. After visiting doctor's offices? Yes. Going to Penn, going to here, going there, and Johnny was just about ready for it. And he was home that Christmas, I remember, and they got all talking about it. And somebody said something about how do I feel about it, and I said, I'm against it. Why? Why would you obey it? I said, I said, I'm not ready for that right now. I said, I just went through three years of pharmacy school with three kids, getting a house, trying to live a little more normal life. Well, this is Frank speaking. He said, Frank. No, Johnny's saying to me, how did I feel about him going back to medical school? Oh, so you're saying you're against it. I'm saying I'm against it. Got it, okay, got it. I said, I've just gone through all this. I'm not ready for this right now. I'm not saying I won't be ready for it maybe three years from now, but right now, i am just, we've gone through three years of, you know, scratching together and living on $50 every two weeks and wondering where the next money's coming. I'm starting to live like, Maybe a normal life. Right. And you want me to take me off into some hellhole in Philadelphia apartment house with three kids, who knows what it's going to be, how we're going to do it. And I said, I, I can't help. You're selfish. I remember John yelling at me, you're selfish. You just want everything your way. Well, looking back, John didn't sacrifice any. Baco's the one that put the money forward for him to go to school. He wasn't ever working to get himself through school in any way, shape, or form. But that's another story. So then he kind of left that go, but he came along with a model car racing thing. And oh, we had to go see it. I went to see it. And Where was this place? Oh, someplace you know? outside of, no, outside of Philadelphia. Was somewhere. it Tom Thumb? Somewhere outside of Philadelphia. I don't remember exactly. So we kept talking about it, and he was getting the information about it. And I was like, da, 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 da. Oh, where were the, we could go to Jack to Reading, and we could sell the house, and we could have X number of money to do this, and, and we could rent a house, and we could get this. And, and I just knew it was, he wasn't, he just, this was going to be it. So it was either going to be on board of this, or I was going to be out in that field. So he begged. Bar and stole to get the money. You know, Baca was going to loan it to us. The last minute Baca blacked out. And that was a low blow. And then he went, oh, he talked to everybody. He talked to Lenny Bilger. He talked to Dr. Chris. He talked to Joe uh, Stern. Anybody he thought that he might be able to tap into a buck. And Somehow, and I don't remember, I really don't remember at all, grandfather talked to Lenny Yoder, the guy at Pennsylvania Bank, that was his buddy. And he had Frank come in and talk to him. And he said, well, Mr. Swinkowski, I think maybe American Bank can help you out here. But I think grandfather had something to do with it. I don't know that grandfather ever put anything up for it, but in those old days, 
bankers knew everybody, and then he owed her new grandfather had the money, and you know, if anything happens, this isn't going down the line, and you know, and so that's how we got thing. And he, I think that was one of, other than the barn, one of the happiest times of your life, of his life. He thoroughly loved them, loved it. He was the boss. He ran it. It was his whole show. Uh, he loved, it. and we had a good. It was a good thing. It was another thing that had a good reputation. People to this day, every once in a while you meet somebody. Oh, that picture! I remember that. That was that was such a neat spot. You know, it had rules and regulations. You could take your kids there. It was a safe place to go. It was a fun place, and it was good while the while the fad was on. But when the fad died off. Then money got tight, and you know, then he had to go work for White Cross, and he was working for the two of them. The fire came along at a wonderful time. Well, how how long was it good? I mean, you, it was such this thing here. It was what, when did he leave up, John? Margaret was three years old. Oh, when we left Allentown. Sixty-five. Yeah, so we had sixty-five to them. And the fire, the fire came. Jennifer was born in August, so it was the February. She was born in '67, so it was February '68. The fire came. So it was in. You know, almost three years you had it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I didn't think it was that long. Yeah. And then the fire came, and that helped us pay got us out, help us to pay for everything, and then we had the money to be able to go buy the house, or put it down payment in the house, and move to Avenue. Got out of the broken house, as 